Welcome to Keeping Up With Trends. This is Fred Razak, Senior Trading Strategist here at CM Trading. And I'm joined with Sergio Davids, your host. Sergio, how goes Yo. life? All, all good, man. It's spring. There's beautiful flowers out. Finally, it's been storming in Cape Town, but for some reason, those brief times I've got sun, it's been awesome. Great. What's on yeah. the plate today? So I thought we'd follow up from our previous um, podcast where we discussed, you know, common trading mistakes. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback where a lot of people wanted us to unpack um, what we mentioned was revenge trading. You know, they were quite interested about that. So I thought today we could talk more about, you know, emotional and part of that, you know, revenge trading. So just to recap, what is emotional trading? I mean, I mean, just on a nutshell, it's just going with, you know, being uh, directed by your emotions to execute trades as opposed to more of what is actually happening in the markets and relating to it from a rational decision. It's an impulse. It's a, uh, it's being taken over by our baser needs, uh, so to speak. Um, so, but it so, stands yep. on a very deep psychological level. So, gi so give me an example. Are we talking about the type of person who, you know, has made a loss, or maybe it's the opposite? You know, you want to ride a high. Is it that kind you know, of so, trading? Okay, so let's pull back a little bit. Um, you know, it's like. It's kind of funny. I don't know about 30 years ago or 50 years ago. Do, do you know about those road rages? You know, those guys that go and, you know, they, they have a road rage. They go on behind the wheel and they. Uh, oh, you know, you mean, yeah, road rage. Yeah, yeah. That's the, no, that's not a couple of decades ago. That happens every day. No, but I'm saying like, I'm saying I don't <laughs> think that it happened about a couple of decades ago. Oh, you know, you're there, saying it didn't happen. People were a lot more chill a certain on the roads. Standard yeah. of there's a certain standard of behavior that is all yeah. of a sudden like accepted that, you know, not that it's accepted, but it's like, you know, it happens more frequent and more often that yeah. we're like, whoa, is that yeah, where society is at? It's actually got a term. It's that common. Yeah, exactly. It actually has a term. Good for you. I like that. Um, and so I think that when someone is revenge trading uh, and this I've seen, it's just like, I've seen it with myself. I've seen it with other people. Basically, you either you miss a move that you thought that you should have been in because you read it, but you didn't go into it. And then you're so angry with it. So you try to get the tail end of it. And then you start losing. Or you saw something that went ahead of you yeah. and you, you didn't really think to do it, but you're so fed up with yourself that it, because you were in it. And let's say you went out of it. And now it finally went towards what you thought it was going to do. And now you've like exasperated. <laughs> I can, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because, you know, it's, it's such a human, you know, reaction to something that should be quite clinical and technical. You know, you've got data in front of you, but for, like you said, it's just, it's, it's a psychological thing. You know, so no, one wants to, no one surgeon. wants to lose. Yeah. I'm saying like you imagine you're a surgeon and you're in the middle of heart, open heart surgery and somehow you did something you thought you should have done and you didn't do it. And then you get like all angry in the middle of the surgery. <laughs> well, like, you, yeah, you can't do put that. put back the kidney or <laughs> attach the right arm. <laughs> you're you a know? professional. You can't so, do that. You know, there's got to be a level. Well, I think inherently we have an inability to accept a loss or you know except when we've done something wrong yes and i think there's a lot of pride we have this belief system that we, that have. we have to know yeah. everything has to be right and i think one of the most powerful moments i had with my kids is yeah. when i actually told them and these are my teenagers that hey you know dad didn't really do something right i made a mistake i didn't handle That's that big. situation correctly that's big you know, uh, you have no idea like how you've you've changed and made them grow as as a people when you realize like your parents, you know, aren't infallible. You know, they're and human beings and they can make mistakes. But the most important thing is that well, you were honest. But not you were just honest that. about your mistake. It also and allows you learn them. From it. 
But not just that, it allows them to make mistakes around you. Meaning if you're not going to accept your mistakes and you're not going to be comfortable with your mistakes, you know, how many times have I heard my mother say something derogatory about herself? You know, when she made a mistake, I'm so stupid, she used to say. Yeah. And I said, I said, that's harsh. That's harsh <laughs> inner critic. Sorry, like, my... <laughs> would you say that to somebody else? My, my mom did the same thing. I'm saying, would you say that to somebody else? No. Right? Well, hopefully. No. So, but yeah. But how come you would say to no. yourself, like, why, why do you not, excuse me for saying this, I don't know about, you know, their, their psychological makeup, but why don't they love themselves enough or have enough compassion and empathy to themselves to say, hey, I made a mistake. Wow, that hurt. That mistake really hurt me. But you know, hopefully, I'll learn from the next time. I think, an, yeah. I think another issue where this also stems from is, you know, as kids, you know, we're taught that the biggest metric for success is, you know, is not failing, right? Failing is the worst thing that could possibly happen right and one of the biggest ways we can show that is the phrase i don't know i don't know used to be um when i okay i, I explained it like this when i was a kid my old man whenever i'd ask him a question and he didn't know the answer he would say i don't know my boy but why don't you find out and together you can you we can discuss it and I would go, you know, to the library or, you know, <laughs> when we had, when we finally got the internet, I would look it up and we'd discuss it. It could be something as banal as how do clouds work, right? As a question I posed to my father, but he would say, why don't you find out? And to this day, I get excited when I don't know things because it means it's a learning opportunity. But how many people do you know who'd have, you know, an allergic reaction to saying they don't know? Because, oh, I mean, because it means you're stupid, right? You're stupid. You right. you not it's... knowing means you're stupid. So then we would rather follow somebody or advice from someone who claims they know than someone who doesn't, right? But the underlining at least it's an premise, answer. the underlining premise is just the de facto that we have to know what we're talking about at any given time, yeah. and that's just ludicrous. Um, and especially when you're trading the financial markets, you know, like. At any given time, the financial markets are really in a custom type of environment. What do I mean by that? Well, at today, the people trading the Euro USD, are they the same people doing it at the same time of the day, putting in the same orders, putting the same size orders, is the same order flow? No. Every single day, you have completely different buyers and sellers in the market that are trading the financial markets. So at every, any given time, you have a custom, quote unquote, activity in the financial markets. So although there are um, situations in the markets that replicate themselves, but it's never the same players, it's never the same time frame, it's never the same, yeah. Yeah. nothing is ever the same. So how do you create money in an inconsistent environment, right? <laughs> How do you do that? Like, imagine your um, customer, okay? Let's say you're a Coca-Cola salesman, right? The master in your shop keeps on changing from place to place, right? And now you have to find this store, and now you have to find that store, and then yeah. there's another place. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, how do you make money in that type of environment? I know how to make money when there is one store, and I distribute it to them, and I get a reorder. See how simple that business is? It's very yeah. simple. But how do you create success in an inconsistent environment? And so the answer is you have to stay consistent. It's I was on about you. to say, what, what advice do you have for you know, traders who might be you know, a little bit more on the emotional side? I mean, how so, do you curb that? Number one, never put yourself in the... Well, once you're emotional, like a mentor of mine taught me some years ago. He goes, you know, especially when you... Like this was more in a law... Uh, a law school kind of environment that I was uh, participating in. And he said yeah. something very simple. He said, once you've already, once, once you're emotional, you're disqualified from having the conversation. You're out. <laughs> you, you can't have a balanced, rational conversation when you're emotional. Because yeah. you're out. There's nothing to talk about. There's nothing for you to 
contribute at that point because you're coming from an emotional base. Now, in some life decisions, yes, do we mix emotions in those decisions, in those rational decisions? Absolutely. You know, we do irrational things. We buy, you know, we had a, a midlife crisis and we buy ourselves a Rolex watch. <laughs> Hasn't happened to me yet, but. <laughs> or a Jag. <laughs> or a Jaguar, right. You know, but we do get into this uh, positions in life where we make irrational decisions. The, the point is, you could afford to make a small, irrational, emotional decision, but you can't afford to do that betting your house. So my right. answer to you is, and just know how to allocate the proper amount of money uh, in those type of, of uh, situations. But the best thing is for you to do is just to lock your hands and not trade. That's, <laughs> you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, FOMO. You know, it triggers it triggers my, you know, fear of missing out. You know, I'll get a bit jittery that there are opportunities and I should be trading. But combine that with what you said in our previous podcast. You know, you sh you said you shouldn't be trading money that you can't afford to lose. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think what's sad is a lot of people seem to think that trading is a get-rich-quick scheme. So they'll throw money, you know, that they can't afford to lose at it without giving it the necessary, you know, training and discipline. And then you lose out. And then you have this, this, this you know, sc scaling, you know, um, cascading failure of, okay, I've just lost. How can I get my money back? Let me trade again. Let me double down. And it's just like a poor gambler, you know, it's a downhill spiral. That's, that's the commonality because people will often say, hey, isn't trading like gambling? So it is, but it's not. Meaning you could create it to, to replicate gambling, you know, if, if you want to, but you can do the other also. You could be much more productive with it yeah. as well. So that's the... Um, I would say that's a catch-22 about trading the financial markets. I mean, a yeah. lot of people go into it, you know, with this false expectations. And then, you know, reality kind of hits in uh, when they lose a considerable amount of money. Um, and that's something that we have to take into consideration before we enter the market. And I say this at every one of my presentations uh, yeah. that I present is that you have to be responsible for your trading. You know, it's your money, it's your hard-earned money that you put in. Right. Um, and yes, there is potential to make lots of money. And yes, I've seen people successful in it. Uh, but it's not to say that it's not a difficult thing to do. I think also that with any, you know, discipline, uh, okay, apart from <laughs> you've got to be disciplined, but it's also about what you put in, you get out. You know, if you're willing to do the work, you're willing to study, you're willing to attend, well, <laughs> your webinars, you're going to get way more out of your trading experience. So we used to say, you know, before um, any trade, have I earned the right? Yeah. I remember you said that in our previous one. It was a very good saying. Have I earned the right? Have I done the work? I think you can apply Just that to I lots of things the right. in life. Yeah. Meaning... Have I earned a right, you know, we, we could manifest a lot of different energy into our life, especially in the, in the realm of, you know, our, the way we act, right, yeah. um, on a subconscious level. But if we're really convinced that we should be millionaires, right, and we deserve it because we did the right thing, right. then nine times out of ten, we will be millionaires. <laughs> I mean, you can't hope for it. You got to do the work. Yeah, you got to do the work. And I think a lot of people don't want to do the work or put in the work. But they, you have entitled. to manifest it initially. Yeah. And I think, finally, any advice out there for, you know, traders that might have gotten a little bit too hot-headed and emotional, you know, at the trading um, desk? Any advice? Um, so I would say, you know, when I was younger, I... I, I must have been a more impulsive trader as I've gotten older. Yeah, a much more impulsive father uh, to my older kids when I was younger. I didn't give them as much. And, I, and it's, a, it's really like 
it's really something that I think is, um, well, you just chill out as you get older. Um, cause you just become more comfortable with who you are. Um, and the earlier, you, the younger you are and the more comfortable you are with being wrong. And this is kind of like yeah. the catch 22. As I get older, I get wiser, but I also realize <laughs> how little I know and how little <laughs> I am significant to the world. <laughs> yeah. That's a <laughs> existential, you know, problem we can but unpack a, on the next. A, yeah. No, but it's humility. At the end of the day, the underlying yeah, it's, score. It's very it, humbling. And I think a lot of people could use a dose of that. But it's you know? not just it's because arrogance is what? What's the definition of arrogance? Arrogance is, if arrogance is the flip side of humility, arrogance yeah. means that it's an exaggerated a sense of self-worth. Self, yeah. I always like to think of arrogance as, you know, pride that you can't back up with any talent. No, but it's like you as know? if you're living because in this illusion. A lot of people are very self-confident and they are talented. Does that make them arrogant? No. Just because you're good at something and you know that you're good at it, that yeah, doesn't make you arrogant. They carry themselves, yeah. No, but that's that's more of a characteristic. That's more of a personality thing. But I'm talking about just exaggerated self sense of self worth, meaning like you're a bus driver or you're a you know you're just a guy. You're you're just a a a market strategist. That's that's good. Did you save for mankind? Did you? create the cure to cancer <laughs> that you should walk around like as if everybody <laughs> owes you something like you yeah. get into so many other kind of sub psychological issues that the person is carrying either entitlement issues, narcissistic issues, um, issues of arrogance is all intertwined with all of that. And usually comes from someone feeling entitled because life has been done to me wrong. Um, and I think that that's where it really comes from. And, uh, you know, there there seems to be like this generational issue today of this entitlement. Like, you know, most men today is like, what do I get? If I get married to her, what do I get? What do you mean, what do you get? <laughs> what You're do marrying I get? her. She's going to carry your children. You owe her. Exactly. She doesn't owe you nothing. <laughs> do you deserve her? Should have been the question. No, but I'm saying like, um, you know, like. What are you bringing into the table? You know, there there was a nice yeah, clip. Of, start uh, I, forget him. I forget his name. He's one of the uh, famous, uh, one of these talk show hosts in the States, uh, Steve Harvey. Yeah, you're right. He's like, boy, what are you bringing to the table? And he was right. <laughs> he was completely right. <laughs> like, exactly. you're the man. <laughs> what are you bringing to the table? Yeah. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, we'll, I think we'll definitely unpack it each one of these top common you know, trading mistakes. Um, I think they deserve a bit more fleshing out. But for now, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Fred, for all your awesome advice and insights, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much.